I know some of you, uh, this is not your first Engage conference that you've been to or El Paso Creation Network conference. And again, I just want to thank all of our many sponsors, individuals, and churches that have helped make this event possible. Um, it is definitely the work of our wonderful team um, to pull this event off, and I'm, we, all, we all are very grateful. Um, so I want to take a, a few minutes just to briefly share with you about Engage Truth Ministries and what we are trying to accomplish to strengthen the church here in El Paso and, and kind of the Southwest as well as, well as we are um, trying to equip the saints in this area and in Las Cruces. And our goal is in the future to give creation tours in Las Cruces. We've um, a while ago have been already in the works of doing that um, preparation for the, we have Demetrodon tracks in Las Cruces. I don't know if you guys have been out there. So... <clears throat> Engage Truth Ministries was actually started in 2018, but came uh, essentially a nonprofit this year. And uh, we launched uh, Engage Truth Summer Camp um, this year. And uh, there's a few of our um, former campers from the past summer who are in the room. Can you guys wait and rave your hands real quick? Um, so, yeah, and I would encourage you to talk with them. At our camp, we had a dinosaur soft tissue lab. We had the ropes course, and it was hosted at Aspendale Camp. You may see their booth in the corner of the gym. And Lord willing, we plan to do a camp again, and it'll have a particular theme and focus. Um, our focus this past year was on the reliability of the Gospels, and uh, we had different events and classes related to that and a lot of team-building activities. Um, we are getting ready to announce um, our plans, but it is going to be the last week of June, and it is a student world, biblical worldview camp um, at Aspendale the last week of June. And we'd love to have adults, if we, you're in here and you'd like to be a part of it, a lot of our adults who came as teachers and counselors, they said they were able to grow as well, um, all the, uh, the training and equipping they had leading up to the event. And we're hoping to double our attendance for our camp, so we're going to need more counselors, um, so we'll plant that seed there now. Um, one of the, the heartbeats of what we do um, recently, and we just started this past semester, is our Engage Truth Worldview Academy. <clears throat> now, some people may think, when, of course, when you think the, of the word apologetics, sometimes people just glaze over, unfortunately. Um, now, we modified our name from Engage Apologetics to just Engage Truth Ministries, and I can tell you the simple reason why. Because we're truth people. If we're Christians, we love the truth. 1 Corinthians 13 says we delight in the truth, right? And, and if, if we delight in the truth, then we should love all fields of knowledge that point to and confirm God's word. His word is our ultimate and final authority, however. And that is very clear. Psalms 119, 160 says the entirety of your word is true. And that is our goal, that we point to reason with people, pointing them to the scriptures, getting them to think about the scriptures, and God's word will do the work. When we are in the Engaged Truth Worldview Academy, students are going deep into creation science with our dinosaur labs, creation guided hikes. We found a bunch of fossils at Franklin Mountains uh, recently. Uh, we're going deep into issues of like the problem of evil. These past few weeks, we've been walking through that. But we're not just sitting there, just to, to learning for the sake of learning. These students are learning for the sake of engaging with the loss. And I want to make that crystal clear. We, we do not let any of this learning eclipse the primacy of the authority of God's word and the, the, the primacy of engaging with others about the gospel. So we were taking students out to go do worldview surveys at UTEP, downtown. We, did a world, we took students to the art museum, and we talked about the worldview of the different artists. And, and then... Uh, we were able to kind of analyze that and see the impact of how that affects art. And some art is not very good with the, without a biblical worldview. It's just a bunch of stuff thrown on the wall. Um, but then we were able to go engage with people downtown. And so our heartbeat is to engage with the lost about the total truth of God's word. And what I want to do is give you, uh, you guys an opportunity to hear from one of our parents and one of our students in the Engage Truth Worldview Academy. And this is, again, our first semester. We plan to start it next semester, continue raising up an, uh, an army of ambassadors for Christ. Adults, college students are welcome to be a part of this. We have middle schoolers and high schoolers uh, learning how to do formal debate in our academy as well. Um, so we'd love for you guys to be a part. Where is, I know some of them are spread out. Um, we could have, uh, Rebecca, would you like to come up? So Rebecca is the daughter of Cindy and Joel Bishop, and we've been blessed to get to know their family. And so um, I was so encouraged reading um, just what she wrote and shared just about how the Academy is helping her grow in evangelism and in her walk with the Lord. Um, yeah, um, so I'm Rebecca. Um, 
Yeah, being in the academy these last few months has been really good for me. It's helped me grow in my faith a lot. Um, just like all the things we've been doing, I've really enjoyed like learning about how reliable the Bible is, um, especially the Gospels, and doing debate um, has been really great too. And we've just like learning cross-examining each other and all of that has been really fun. Also just like the fellowship in the academy has been really nice, just getting to be around kids who want to learn about the Bible also and just having fun together. And um, also like he said, going to UTEP and um, downtown was really great because I always thought it would be so scary to try to talk to people about like my faith and like I just thought there was no way but going like it really helps me get more confidence and it also helped me want to learn more about the Bible so that I'd be able to share better with others. Um, yeah, so the academy has been really great. We have a great teacher. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Rebecca. Um, and we could have many students, so we wouldn't have time to cover other things. But you know, my, one of my favorite things is seeing other, our other students in the academy um, engaging with others about the gospel with unbelievers at UTEP and downtown. Um, that's what we're about. We are an evangelism ministry. We're not just about uh, merely the defense for the sake of it, to strengthen the believers, equip them, and get them out to share with the lost. Um, Marie is actually working the Biblical Science Institute table. I don't know if she's in here right now. Um, she was going to share. All right, yeah, come on up. And how about a round of applause for all our hard work with the BSI table? <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Um, my name is Marie Arellano. I have two children who are enrolled in the Worldview Academy with Caleb, and it's been a pleasure. It's been a great blessing for our family. I feel that even though I go and drop them off, I don't drop them off. It's not a drop off. It could be a drop off program, but I've chosen to stay, and I feel as if it's even been, uh, I'm going to school myself. Um, as an adult, and I've known the Lord for 20 years now. I believe this has given us as a family a refresh, a refreshing way how to approach those that don't know the Lord. Um, the way Caleb has embarked in challenging the students, um, us, the moms that sit there on the back, uh, we've become part of their, of their dialogue. And it's very enriching. We get to challenge our kids even to we pretend to be atheists and challenge them, and that is really difficult. Um, Caleb goes ahead and challenges us parents even to be involved. So uh, one of the areas that my, I've noticed that my kids have grown is in the evangelism and be, feeling confident to approach people that are strangers. We ourselves as parents went ahead and go and give tracts and talk to people about the gospel, but till now, we, we've seen them desiring to even, oh, I have a way to approach them just by asking them a simple question. And Caleb goes ahead and, and gives you a format to go ahead and approach him to, his favorite phrase is to put a rock in their shoe. And, um, and that is, it, it, it's opened the opportunity to great conversations with many students uh, downtown, as you heard him say, we went to the, to the museum and seeing it from a biblical worldview, someone presenting it to us and explaining it, that and dissecting it, it was very enriching for all of us. And I really thank the Lord for Caleb's life and his family. And I encourage each and every one of you to continue to pray for him and for his team. And and I hope to see more, more of you all go and attend. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, sister. Thank you again, Marie. Um, so come talk to us at our booth. We have one more break after this session, which will be the last call to check out the booths. And uh, we'd love to share with you more about the academy or our summer camp or our creation tours as well. So our, nec our next session here is Astronomy Reveals Creation by Dr. Lyle. And now the big question is, what does astronomy have to say about the truth of the Bible? Many people use astronomy to challenge scripture, but what do the heavens actually reveal? 
Through this presentation, we will see how the universe declares the glory of God and how the Bible is right when it talks about the basics of astronomy. Dr. Lyle? It's good to be back with you this afternoon. I hope you had a good lunch. And uh, again, astronomy is our theme for the day. So I want to show you how astronomy reveals creation. And the goal here is just to give you some little uh, tidbits to share with your friends who are perhaps under the impression that astronomy somehow refutes the Bible because it, it really doesn't. It uh, confirms biblical creation, the Christian, the Christian worldview. And we'll see how the secrets of the cosmos confirm what the Bible teaches. We're going to look at four aspects of creation, of astronomy, and how they are consistent with Scripture. We're going to see that the glory of God is revealed in creation, as the Bible teaches in Psalm 19.1. The universe is not a chance accident or an explosion or something like that. It is amazingly well designed, and it reveals God's glory. We're going to see that the Bible is right when it speaks on the basics of astronomy, things that you would learn in a freshman astronomy class. The Bible does touch on some of those issues, and of course it does so correctly because it's written by inspiration from God. We're going to see that the Bible is right when it addresses the age of the cosmos. We'll see that there's, there's evidence that's consistent with the biblical time scale. Lines of evidence that you don't often hear in the media or in public schools and things like that because it goes against the narrative, but the evidence is there nonetheless. We're going to see the Bible is right when it addresses the uniqueness of Earth as a world that God formed to be inhabited and something that is apparently unique in the universe. And so these are areas of creation that confirm that what the Bible teaches is right. And ultimately, these, we're not judging the Bible by these lesser standards, but we're pointing out that the Bible is consistent with the world around us and our understanding of that when we understand the world properly. It lines up with scriptures so that our faith does not rest on the wisdom of men, but on the power of God. So let's jump right in and see how the glory of God is revealed in creation. The Bible says in Psalm 19.1, the heavens declare the glory of God. The skies proclaim the work of his hands. And indeed they do. And there are many ways in which the universe declares God's glory. We're going to focus on two. We're going to see how the size of the universe declares God's glory and how the beauty of the universe declares God's glory. Those are two aspects that, in my mind, have really attracted me to the field of astronomy. It's beautiful, and the scale of things is just outrageous. Now, the beauty of the universe, you certainly don't have to be a PhD astrophysicist to appreciate that. You can go out on a clear night and look up and get, get away from city lights, and it's just beautiful what you can see. And with a telescope, you can see even more. And again, we're privileged to live in an age where we now have spacecraft. We have telescopes in space, like the Hubble Space Telescope, or more recently, the James Webb Space Telescope. And we, you've seen images of these things, I'm sure. And it's, it, the, the beauty is astonishing. God paints beautiful artwork, and he does so on an enormous canvas. And it's fun to see that. The size of the universe is something that is harder to convey. And I dare say none of us really fathom that. We can write down the distances to these things using scientific notation, which allows us to express enormous numbers in a relatively small space. But in terms of you know, thinking through what does that mean, it's beyond me. But I can at least compare things to other things and kind of show you, kind of build up and, and, and see how things compare to other things in size. We'll start with the moon. The moon is about the same size as the United States in terms of its diameter. If you were to put the United States up at the same distance as the moon, it would cover the same area. And you say, but it's awfully small. That's because it's 240,000 miles away. And that's a distance that you can kind of get your mind around, 240,000 miles. Some of you, if you've got a really good car, it might have 240,000 miles on it. <laughs> so theoretically, you could have driven to the moon, but probably not back. <laughs> so. Yeah, so that just gives you kind of a feel. You, you can kind of understand that distance. Uh, the moon is, it has a unique beauty to it. It's kind of a desolate beauty, but it is beautiful. This is the moon as it looks. This is actually a composite image of the moon taken from individual images that have been stitched together by the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter that's orbiting the moon, taking high resolution images of the surface. I love showing people the moon through a small telescope. First reaction is usually, wow. And then the second is, can you see the flag? that the astronauts planted. And uh, 
When you consider that's the size of the United States, no, you're not going to be able to see the flag. But the thing is, we now have such detailed resolution, high-res images, thanks to the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter, that we can see the locations where the astronauts landed. And in some cases, the flag that they planted. Isn't that interesting? So I want to show you one of these. Uh, we're going to zoom in here on Mare Tranquillitatis, this large maria. Maria is Latin for seas. They used to think those dark regions were seas. They're not. They're basalt, rock but they're a little darker than the highlands surrounding them. And as we zoom in on Mare Tranquillitatis, the Sea of Tranquility, this is the landing site of the Apollo 11 spacecraft, the first manned mission to the moon. This is where they landed. And you can continue to zoom in on this and continue to zoom in on it and so on at higher and higher resolution until you get to the actual uh, location there. And you can see the lower portion of the lunar module they, remember that spider-like looking structure? They, they left the lower portion of that when they launched. They just launched the top portion to save fuel. So the bottom portion is still there, along with some instruments that they left on the moon's surface. That dark line that, that extends over to that crater and back and then down this way, that's the footprints of those astronauts as they walked on the lunar surface. Isn't that fascinating? So you got 50-year-old footprints there. And they're not going anywhere because the moon has no atmosphere. There's no wind on the moon. There's no maid service, so that there, you know, those footprints are going to be there for a very long time. So pretty amazing. So there you go. So that gives you a feel for the size of the moon. And yes, we did land there. Now, the, the, you can't see the flag on this one because it fell over when they launched. Buzz Aldrin, looking out the window, noticed that. They put it too close to the spacecraft. But the other ones are still standing, and sometimes you can see the shadow of them. It's pretty neat. So anyway, so there's the moon in first quarter phase. That's where it's, the phases are caused by the angle between the moon and the sun. So you can see the sun would be off to the right, wouldn't it? It's illuminating the day side of the moon there. And this is the best phase to see the moon because you can, you can see from the shadows of the craters. It just gives it, you can tell it's a sphere. It's not maybe obvious in the PowerPoint, but when you see it with your eyes, it's just obvious that the moon is spherical. It's really amazing. And that's not only a testimony to the beauty of this world, but to the the amazing design of the human brain to be able to look at that and, and calculate from the, from the tr trigonometry, calculate that that must be a sphere in order for the shadows to look the way that they do. It's amazing. Your brain is doing this fairly sophisticated geometrical calculation. It's astonishing. You get this, I mean, it, what an amazing design. God's given you this amazing computer in your skull, a computer made out of meat that can figure that stuff out. It's amazing. Uh, here's the moon compared to the Earth. You can see the moon is smaller than the Earth. So you say, well, we got a pretty big planet there. And indeed we do. If you've ever driven through Kansas, you know the Earth is big. <laughs> it's big. And, uh, and it is big until you compare it to other planets like Saturn. There's Saturn compared to the size of the Earth. Saturn's about nine Earths across. And that's just the planet. The rings extend farther out in space. The rings are trillions of tiny little moonlets that orbit around Saturn's equator. And so Saturn, pretty big. Now, when you look at Saturn in a backyard telescope, it looks like it's about that big. And it's, no, it's beautiful. You can see the rings, and it is stunning. And, and again, the reaction, everybody, when they look at Saturn, wow. And then they look down the telescope, like, are you tricking me? Is that a slide? Because it, it, nothing looks like it. And it's so cool. To see it with your own eyes, it's, it's just magic. There's something about seeing it. I mean, that's pretty. But when you see it with your own eyes, there's something magical about that that photographs don't quite capture. But uh, it, just look, you, you, it just looks like it's about that big. You just want to grab it and stick it in your pocket and take it home with you. But you can't because it's nine times the size of the Earth. So there you go. And it looks that small because it's a billion miles away. And that's, you're starting to get into real distances there. That's pretty impressive. And you say, well, you know, the Earth's maybe not that big, but at least, well, at least we got big planets. Saturn's big until you compare it to the sun. There's the sun. The sun is 100 Earths across. And just to give you a sense of scale, those sunspots that you see there, those are about the size of the Earth. So that gives you kind of a feel for how big the sun is. And the sun is a star, or stars or suns, if you like. And we, we kind of take that for granted in our modern age. But that was a real revelation in, in the ancient times, that those little tiny pinpricks of light you see in the night sky are the same type of object as the sun. They're just much further away. The sun is a mere 93 million miles away. It's our next door neighbor. How long would it take to drive 93 million miles at like 65 miles an hour? Over 160 years. So you couldn't do it in your lifetime. That's without stopping for bathroom breaks. Okay? 
But those other stars are so much further away that they just, you, you see them in the night sky. They don't even make the sky turn blue or anything because they're far, they're, they don't give off as much light from our perspective. Now, the sun is above average in terms of its size. So you said we got a pretty big star. We do. The red dwarf stars, which are more common than the sun, are smaller than the sun. There's are some, some uh, relatively nearby red dwarf stars. But there are stars that are much bigger than the sun. You saw some of these in the created cosmos. I'll show you some now. Mintaka, that's one of the stars of Orion's belt, the rightmost star on Orion's belt. It's quite a bit larger than the sun. It's a blue supergiant. White supergiants are larger than that. Canopus, for example, which you can see, you can see that from Texas in the, in around February in the evening sky low in the south. The, the star's kind of by itself, that's Canopus. That's a white supergiant. And then red, red supergiants are bigger than that, like Antares, which is even bigger than Betelgeuse. And you saw this in the created cosmos, but if you put this where the, sol where the sun is in the solar system, we'd be inside it. It's amazing. So that's, that gives you a feel for the size of some of these stars, some of the larger ones. And stars get maybe twice that big, but not, not a whole lot bigger than that. For phys physics reasons, they, they, they don't get much bigger than that. So our solar system, if you were to put it in a box, you could put it in a box that's about 6 billion miles on a side. That's pretty good. So that gives you a feel for how big our solar system is in terms of units that we have some knowledge of. But the, in order to get to the next largest structure in space, we're going to have to zoom out quite a bit by a factor of 10 to get to 60 billion miles, and then by another factor of 10 to get to 600 billion miles. And that gets you about to the scale where you can start seeing the next l largest or the next, yeah, I guess the next largest objects, which would be planetary nebulae. So a nebula is a cloud of hydrogen and helium gas spread out over a vast region of space. Again, hundreds of times larger than our solar system that cloud of gas that you see there. And if it's hot, it'll glow. Not all nebulae glow. There are dark nebulae, like the coal sack, that you, the only reason you know it's there is there are stars behind it that are blocked. And so it looks like a little hole in space. But if they're hot, if the gas is hot, it'll glow. And you get these wonderful colors, and it's extraordinary. Now, a planetary nebula is where there's a star in the middle. Either the star is still burning, or it's collapsed in on itself and become a white dwarf. Either way. And that star has produced that nebula. It's ejected gas out to make that shape. So planetary nebula change a little bit from century to century as they expand into space. As we go out a little bit further, that, by the way, that was the jewel bug nebula. It's one of the smaller ones. The next, a next, uh, not the next, but a, a slightly larger planetary nebula would be the ring nebula. That one's kind of neat because it's about a light year across, which is 5.88 trillion miles. So when you hear, again, when you hear that term light year, people get intimidated, they think, because hear, you hear billions of light years, that doesn't mean billions of years, okay? It just, it's a distance. And you multiply it by 5.88 trillion to get the distance in miles, if you want a unit that we're sort of familiar with. So, but because the distances in space are outrageous, we tend to use light years. That keeps the number kind of small. So some planetary nebula have this bipolar structure where they're sort of two lobes and we think that's because the star has formed a, a disk around it of material that channels the, the flow in, out the north and south pole of the star. So that's um, a lovely nebula. Another, but there are other nebulae that are larger than planetary nebulae, and they're not produced by a star. They have stars around them that are making them glow, such as the Horsehead Nebula. And that's one that um, is very difficult to see because it's very reddish in color and your, your eyes don't, when you're, when, you're, when you're out at night using a telescope, you're using the rods in your eyes rather than the cones. And rods can't really see red very well. They, they see blue and green much better. So it's, it's almost impossible to see that with a small telescope to just the naked eye, but a camera can pick it out because cameras can pick up red very well. And so I've got some images of the Horsehead Nebula that are quite lovely. So there's the Horsehead Nebula. Very pretty. So that's, you see a dark, there's a dark nebula in front of a nebula that's bright, and that's what gives it that unique shape. This is about 22 light years across, this image. We go out even deeper into space, you find things like globular star clusters. I love these things. You saw one in the created cosmos. Um, but this is a um, globular star cluster. It's where you have about 100,000 stars in a space that's oh, maybe 50 light years across, something like that. So it, it, they're stunningly beautiful. And again, the, the picture doesn't quite capture it. You can see these in a small telescope. Anything larger than eight inches, you can easily see the individual stars in a globular cluster. I mean, you can see the cluster in binoculars, but it looks like a little fuzzball. 
it, it takes at least a six inch, maybe an eight inch telescope to see individual stars in them. And they are beautiful. And it reminds me of that verse that says that God calls them all by their names. God has a name for each one of those stars, a purpose for it. He's keeping track of it. He knows where it is. Not only does he know where the star is, he knows where every atom in that star is and what it's doing. It's pretty amazing. There are a few hundred of these that orbit kind of around the center of our galaxy. Our galaxy is a much larger structure. It's about 80,000 light years across. Our galaxy looks something like that. That's, a, that's another galaxy. We don't have a picture of our galaxy from the outside because we're in it and we, we can't really go, we can't, you know, it's not like Star Trek where we can zip out and take a picture and then zip back in. So as cool as that would be. So this is the M82 galaxy, but it's, it, it's similar to ours, it, it's a spiral galaxy. But what you're seeing there is the combined light of about 100 billion stars. And there's so many stars that, in the, especially in the core, where you, you can't really see individual stars. They just kind of blend together and glow. Now, in the, in the arms, sometimes you can see the brighter blue stars in the arms. Sometimes you can see the individual ones, but pretty amazing. Back before 1920, astronomers could see these objects. They didn't realize what they were, though, because they didn't have the detail we have today. They could see these clouds, and they thought maybe they were nebulae. And so they're, they're, you'll see in very old textbooks, they'll refer to them as spiral nebulae because they thought they were clouds of hydrogen and gas. They're not. They're other galaxies like ours. They thought they were small and inside our galaxy. And it wasn't until the 1920s that uh, men like Edwin Hubble and others uh, were able to calculate the distance to these things um, using various methods that I won't go into. But it's, 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 an interesting, it's an interesting story if you're interested in that. Galaxies sometimes come in clusters, small clusters or large clusters. This is Stefan's quintet. Um, I, picture, I, I love this one. It's just beautiful. It is something you can see with a, back, a fairly modest backyard telescope. I've got a 14 inch and I've been able to see Stefan's quintet. Now it doesn't look that pretty in the telescope, but you can see five little faint glowing galaxies there. So that's pretty neat. And then the, the one of them that's bluer, it's closer. It's not part of the group. It's an interloper. It's, it's photobombing that group. Okay. <laughs> it's getting in the way there. So that happens sometimes. As we go out even deeper into space, those are not stars you're seeing there. Each one of those little pinpricks of light is a galaxy with anywhere from millions to trillions of stars each. That's the Hubble Ultra Deep Field, which is about as far out as we could go until recently. And the James Webb Space Telescope got even farther. But isn't that amazing? You see galaxy upon galaxy upon galaxy upon galaxy. Small little section of space in the, near the Big Dipper. It's amazing and beautiful. Now, astronomers wanted to go out even deeper into space. I think that's a great goal. We want to explore more. We want to see what God's created. Secular astronomers believe that, that all that just kind of popped into existence. Big Bang, 13.8 billion years ago, and the universe exploded into existence. Stars formed allegedly from gas and then collected into galaxies. And so they believe that galaxies have evolved. It's not the same as biological evolution, but it's a secular view of origins. And in the secular view, as you look out deeper into space, because you're looking farther away, and because light, even though it's very fast, the idea is light has taken a long time to get from there to here. And so in the secular view, as you look out deeper into space, you're kind of looking back in time. You're seeing the universe not as it is, but as it was. Now, that's a nuanced issue because Einstein found that the way we define now at a distance, there's more than one way to do it. And so, in fact, um, depending on how you define time, we can be seeing the universe as it is now, not as it was. So it doesn't necessarily take any time at all to get the light from those galaxies to the Earth. It can certainly happen within the 6,000 year um, time span. And I'm not gonna go into details on that. I have articles on the website. My book, The Physics of Einstein, goes into that. But my point is the secularists believe that as you look out deeper, you're looking back in time. And so they designed the James Webb Space Telescope to look out beyond where Hubble can see to distances where they're thinking, you're looking so far back in time, you should, there, there's a time where there weren't any galaxies. And, and the James Webb Space Telescope ought to be able to see that. And frankly, as you get close to that, you ought to see baby galaxies, galaxies that are just starting to form, where the stars are starting to collect. And they ought to be kind of lumpy and irregular until they, because it takes, it's supposed to take time for them to develop into spirals. And so the James Webb was, part of the reason for it was to confirm secular origins stories. That's part of the motivation behind it. Sorry to break that to you, but that's, that's the way it is. That being said, 
um, it's a wonderful design. It's brilliantly designed, the this, this space telescope. And I, I've know, I, I know some of the people that have worked on it. It's amazing. And it's designed to detect infrared wavelengths. And the reason for that is the farther away galaxies are, the more their light has been redshifted, apparently because they're moving away from us. And um, th there's a point at which they're so redshifted, the human eye can't detect them anymore. They're shifted below our ability to see. James Webb can see that. It can see infrared. So that's why it was designed for that. And secularists made some predictions about what they would see with the James Webb Space Telescope. They would see fewer and fewer galaxies as you go farther out, because you're going back in time, in their view. And so there ought to be a point where there aren't any galaxies at, a, at light that's been redshifted by 14. That, that corresponds to a distance, and therefore a time, in their view, beyond which there should be no galaxies. Okay. And then they also predicted that the farthest galaxies, which should be very, very few, would be very low mass and clumpy and irregular because it takes time for them to grow as they accumulate more stars and interact with each other and become these lovely spirals that we find nearby. And finally, they were expecting that the farthest galaxies would have no heavy elements. What does that mean? Well, the Big Bang is supposed to produce hydrogen, helium, and lithium, the three lightest elements, and that's it. The conditions aren't right. even. If we, even if we accept the secular thinking as a hypothesis, to produce anything heavier. But there are more elements than just three. There's things like oxygen and carbon. Where did those come from? In the secular view, stars that formed after the Big Bang and started fusing hydrogen after they run out of fuel and explode, they, that explosion produces the heavier elements. And therefore, the next generation of stars um, that, that gobbles up the remains of the previous generation now has some heavy elements. That's the secular view. So they're expecting that the oldest galaxies, the farthest ones, should have no heavy elements, like oxygen, carbon, things like that. Make sense? Because the Big Bang can't produce those. So that was the secular predictions. And I thought, I don't believe any of those. And so I'm going to make some creation predictions based on my understanding of the Bible and God creating a mature universe. Not an old one, but a mature one. So I'm predicting that there would be lots of galaxies at great distances even beyond redshift 14, because I don't believe in the Big Bang, and so I don't believe there's any reason, I don't believe galaxies just form. I think God created them, and he created them all as adult galaxies, just like he did with Adam and Eve. And so I'm not expecting to see, I'm not expecting to see baby galaxies. I'm expecting the farthest galaxies that we can detect would be fully formed, massive, and well-structured, and that they will exist at greater distances than the secularists expect. Why would God stop at redshift 14? I think they continue to go on out. And then finally, I'm predicting that the farthest galaxies would in fact have heavy elements in them. See, I know from scripture that things like oxygen, for example, which is a heavy element, it existed before the stars. Because Genesis 1-2, when God first makes the earth, the Holy Spirit's hovering over the surface of the waters. Water is H2O, it's got oxygen in it. Stars aren't made until day four. So I know that oxygen existed before stars. And so I don't have any reason to think that the farthest stars would lack the heavy elements. I think they're going to have them. And I was confident enough that my predictions would be right because they're based on scripture. And my secular friends, their predictions would be wrong. I was confident enough in that that I also predicted how they would respond when their predictions failed. <laughs> so I, pr I predicted that they would say things like, Webb discovers that galaxies form much earlier than previously thought. Because they're going to find galaxies out farther than they were expecting. And rather than give up the Big Bang, they're just going to push galaxy formation and say, it must have happened much more quickly than the computer simulations show. So that was, what, that was my prediction. I made that in 2022, January. You can see the article. You can go to the website. There it is, January 21st, 2022, right? That was before James Webb had started collecting data. And in July of 2022, the James Webb Space Telescope sent back our first images of these deep regions of space far enough out where there shouldn't be any galaxies. And what did it see? It's pretty amazing. Galaxies upon now that you can't immediately tell what the distances are, but basically the redder ones are farther, are farther out. And, um, and they did some preliminary estimates of the distances to these galaxies, and they found lots of galaxies at great distances, even beyond redshift 14. So one of the estimates went out to a redshift of 20. That was way beyond what the Big Bang folks were expecting, way beyond. And amazingly, these galaxies 
were fully formed, massive and well-structured. They didn't find baby galaxies. They found, fully, they found massive ones, com comparable in mass to our own galaxy at these incredible distances, which is what I was expecting, but not what the secularists were expecting. And uh, James Webb is equipped with a spectroscope which can determine what element made the light. It's, it senses atomic fingerprints, basically, and it found evidence of heavy elements in these largest galaxies. Things like oxygen and carbon were detected in these most distant galaxies, contrary to the secular predictions, but in line with what I know from scripture. Pretty neat. Now, again, I also predicted how they would respond. I was, I was going to predict that they would say this. Webb discovers that galaxies formed much earlier than previously thought. How did they respond? Galaxies started forming much earlier than many astronomers previously thought. <laughs> That's in, uh, yeah. It's UConn today, August 9th, 2022. Here's another one. Massive galaxies formed earlier in the universe than previously known. Here's another one. Re evidence is building that the first galaxies formed much earlier than expected. Sky and Telescope, January 10, 2023. So 2022 was a fun year. It really was. So pretty neat. See, the Bible not only tells me about the universe, it tells me something about human nature. <laughs> and when people find evidence that's contrary to their deepest commitments, they don't re-examine their deepest commitments. They just reinterpret the data. We all, we're all subject to that. So anyway, so that's, that's what we found. And it's amazing. It's beautiful. Fully designed galaxies. There's no evidence of galaxy evolution there. They look pretty similar to galaxies nearby. And that's what I would have expected. And I love the way the Bible describes the creation of all these hundreds of billions of galaxies. It's summed up in this little phrase, he made the stars also. Yeah, it's pretty neat. As if it was so easy for God to create all that. And of course it was because he's God. It's not a problem for him. So certainly the glory of God is revealed in his universe. And we've seen that. What about the basics of astronomy? Things that you would learn in a freshman level astronomy class? You know, when the Bible touches on the basics of astronomy, it's always right. The Bible's not an astronomy textbook. Um, it, it's, it's not meant to be. But nonetheless, when it touches on astronomy, it's right because it's God's word. God built the universe. He knows how it works. And so that's not a problem uh, for him. The, the interesting thing, though, is that's always been the case, even when the secular experts of the time period disagreed. In other words, when there, are, there are places where the Bible says something about the nature of the universe, where secularists at that time, at the time the verse was written, would have disagreed with that. But today they'd have to agree the Bible got it right. And I want to give you some examples of these. The roundness of the earth, for example. There was a time when people believed the earth was flat. And the Bible indicates that it's round and not just round spherical because the Bible says in Job 26.10 that God inscribes a circle on the surface of the waters at the boundary between light and darkness. What's that referring to? It's referring to what's called the terminator where light stops or terminates. That's the boundary of light and darkness. That's where evening and morning occur. And it is a circle because the earth is a sphere. The only way you can have a circular terminator on an object is if the object is spherical. There's no other object that will always produce a circular terminator. So that's clearly taught in Job 26.10. So that's the boundary between light and darkness. And it's on the waters because Earth's surface is mostly water. So there you go. So the Bible taught that, Job 26.10. So that's only possible on a sphere. Now the interesting thing, Job, we think was written around 2000 BC. There's a lot of good indicators in, in the text that it was written in. But the funny thing is, until around 500 BC, all pagan cultures, as far as I know, believed that the earth was a flat disk. Even the Greeks, up until about 500 BC, thought the earth was flat. Uh, many of them believed it floated in water. It was kind of a disk that floated in water. Um, the Greeks eventually, th thought, eventually realized that it floats in space, but they still thought it was flat for a while. So the Bible was right, and those experts, they were wrong. And they have egg on their face today. And, bu and by the way, the idea that Christopher Columbus was the first to come up with the earth being round or was out to prove it is a myth. People already knew the world was round at the time of Columbus. They just didn't know how big it was and he thought it'd be faster to go that way, which it isn't. But I'm glad he made the trip. <laughs> so, yeah. Earth floats in space. God hangs the earth upon nothing. It's a great description of the nature of gravity. God, the, the earth is suspended in space. It hangs on nothing. And we, can, we have pictures of it now that confirm that. Might have been hard to believe when it was written, because again, it, first of all, it's hard to picture that. I mean, today we have pictures, but in the ancient world, to think, well, the earth floats on nothing, that can't be. 
The ancient cultures thought it floated in water. The Babylonians thought that. Even the Greeks thought that in you know, 800s BC around there. And that makes more sense because you can see, we understand buoyancy. We can see things float in water. We get that. But to hang something on nothing, you can't do that. Well, you can't, but God can, and he has. And the Bible was exactly right. Now, it's written poetically, but it's still true. The expansion of the universe. Isaiah 40.22 states that God stretches out the heavens like a curtain and spreads them out like a tent to dwell in, indicating that, the, that God has increased the size of the universe since its creation. So what would that look like? Well, if, you have, if that's what it looked like at creation, and God has stretched it out, then it looks more like that today. Okay? Stretches or is stretching. Tense is a little difficult in Hebrew. So, but in any case... So that indicates the expansion of the universe. That was discovered by scientific means in the late 1920s. Pretty neat. And it's not obvious. If you go outside tonight and look at the sky, and you go out tomorrow night and look at the sky, it, it looks about the same size. It's not obvious that it's expanding. It's not obvious. Uh, it required modern scientific equipment like telescopes and spectroscopes to be able to measure the redshifts of the galaxies to find that they are, in fact, receding away from us and from each other. And that's what we call the, the Hubble Law, after Edwin Hubble, who did a lot of the early research on that. So pretty neat. Now, some people have thought, well, does this mean a Big Bang? Because if they're farther out today, that means they were closer in the past. True? Yes. But if you, if you keep running it back and keep running it back, does that mean they were all, that they came from a point that exploded into existence 13.8 billion years ago? No. Just because something's expanding today doesn't mean it came from a point. It doesn't mean that it exploded into existence 13.8 billion years ago. Some of you are expanding a bit. That doesn't mean you exploded into existence 13.8 billion years ago, right? It just means the universe was smaller when it was created. Nor, is the, nor was this a prediction of the Big Bang. A lot of people think, well, didn't the Big Bang predict that the universe was expanding? And there it is. You know, no. The expansion was discovered in the 1920s. The Big Bang, the idea of the universe coming from a point, was 1931. George Lemaitre, who invented the Big Bang, already knew about the expansion of the universe, and that was his way of explaining it naturalistically. Now, he did believe in God, but he didn't believe that God had anything to do with creation. He didn't believe in Genesis. So he was trying to find a naturalistic explanation for uh, the universe apart from God. Conservation of mass and energy. I believe the Bible teaches that the amount of stuff in the universe is constant. You can change stuff into other stuff, but you can't create something from nothing, and you can't get rid of something. You can't make it cease to exist. And we'd expect that, first of all, because God ended his work of creation by the seventh day. He was done, right? And all things were made by him. That means nothing new is going to pop into existence because it would mean God's still creating, which cannot be because, all, because God ended his work by the seventh day. Or it would mean something could come into existence apart from God which cannot be because all things were made by him. So those two principles together indicate no new material is going to come into existence. God allows us to transform the materials we have. We, you know, we can do chemistry and change what, you know, one molecular substance into another, but this, it's the same amount of stuff. And we would expect stuff doesn't cease to exist because Christ upholds all things by the word of his power. He maintains that which he created, and in him all things hold together or consist. So nothing, material is not going to cease to exist either. And those two principles together are what we call conservation of mass or conservation of energy. Einstein realized that energy and mass really are the same thing. They're just measured in two different ways. Now, when these verses were written, Genesis, around 1446 BC, somewhere around there. I can't get an exact date, but during, you know, during the Exodus. And then these other um, verses are New Testament. So those are all first century. So that's when the Bible was claiming that conservation of mass energy... Uh, when did scientists figure it out? Well, conservation of mass, 1785. Conservation of energy, 1842. And it's interesting, though, because you think, well, you know, James Joule is credited with the discovery of conservation of energy, along with Mayer. But um, Joule was apparently a Bible believer. And he wrote, he indicated when he discovered conservation of energy that it, well, it makes sense because God's not creating anymore. So he, he used Genesis as part of his argument, which I think is pretty neat. So he was thinking biblically, and that led him to make the scientific discovery. So there you go. But the Bible had it right long before the secular experts of the day. Back when the Greeks were thinking that st new stuff can come into existence, the Bible says, nope, God's done creating. And the Bible was right, and the experts of the day were wrong. Innumerable stars. The Bible describes Abraham's descendants as numerous as the stars of the heavens and the sand which is on the seashore, which is a figure of speech indicating 
a humanly uncountable number. And the Bible says as much in Genesis 32, 12, which, which is too great to be numbered or which cannot be numbered for multitude. So there you go. And that's a great, a, a great analogy for a humanly uncountable number. You can't count the number of stars, right? But it might have seemed like not such a great analogy when it was first written because the number of stars you can see naked eye, somewhere between 3,000 and 10,000, we estimate. And you could count to 10,000. It would be tedious, but you could do it. And then in 1608, the telescope was invented by Hans Lippershey. Galileo built his own in 1610, and he pointed up at the, at the Milky Way, that cloudy band you see in the summer sky, he pointed out, oh, that's billions of stars. We estimate there's at least 100 billion stars in our galaxy. You can't count to 100 billion in your lifetime. There's not enough seconds to do it. So it's a great analogy for a humanly uncountable number. And we think there's at least as many galaxies as there are stars in our own. So, by the way, there was a time in the Middle Ages when many astronomers thought there were 1,022 stars. Where did that number come from? Ptolemy had cataloged 1,022 stars. He was a Greek astronomer, and there was a philosophy at the time that everything worth knowing had been discovered by the Greeks, basically. They could do no wrong. Even though Ptolemy never claimed that his list was exhausted, uh, they thought it must be, despite the fact you can see more than 1,022 stars. So it's kind of interesting. It just shows you how a bad philosophy can cause you to reinterpret and misinterpret what's right in front of you. So have we learned a lesson of history? Because when the experts of the day have disagreed with the Bible, the Bible has always turned out to be right. Every time, every one of those that I've shown you, when the verse was written, the secular experts of the day did not believe it. And they are what we call wrong. Yeah. Right? Have we learned that lesson? I, I hope you've learned that lesson. When, when God's word touches on something, it is right. God doesn't need your help to reinterpret his word to be consistent with what the secularists think is the case. Let God's word be true, though every man a liar. Not everyone's learned that lesson because there's, there's one aspect today where secularists, I mean, secularists would have to agree, yeah, the world's round. The Bible got that right. Expansion of the universe, the Bible got that right. The uh, number of stars, the Bible got that right. But the Bible's wrong about the age of the cosmos. Now, those people have not learned a lesson of history, have they? They've not learned a lesson of history. But what I want to show you is that the evidence is consistent with what the Bible teaches about the age of the cosmos. The Bible does teach what we might call a young cosmos. I don't, I don't like using that term because 6,000 years is hardly young. I mean, how many of you are even 1,000 years old, right? I mean, and the universe is six times older than that. But it's young compared to what the secularists believe, so maybe we're stuck with it. But in any case, we covered uh, this morning that God did create in six days. And from those genealogies, we know that was a few thousand years ago, something like 6,000 years ago. And please don't, I'm not trying to put an exact date on it because I don't think we can. We don't know how they rounded the ages in scripture, but it's, it's not going to be millions of years is the point. And I want to show you that there's evidence that is contrary to that, but how do we evaluate the evidence? And this is something I need to give a little bit of an explanation for the arguments, the scientific arguments that argue against a billions of years old universe. They are all based on what's called an internal critique. An internal critique is where we accept, for the sake of hypothesis, the secular assumptions, and then show that they lead to an inconsistency. It's a reductio ad absurdum. You're reducing your opponent's position to absurdity by temporarily standing on it and showing that it leads to a contradiction. That's a very powerful way of debating, by the way. I would encourage you all to think through these, uh, the reductio ad absurdum. It's very powerful. Jesus often used it in his earthly ministry. So what are the secular assumptions that are involved in age estimates? There are two, primarily. Naturalism. Secularists believe that what we see today was not formed supernaturally by God. Now, by the way, I don't believe that everything we see today, like this church building, I don't think it was formed supernaturally by God. It was made by people. I get that. It's subsequent to creation. But I don't believe that everything came about by natural means or by man-made means. I believe that some things were supernaturally created, like the solar system, the first galaxies, and so on. So I'm not a naturalist. Naturalism would say everything comes about naturalistically within the laws of nature, and therefore no, no miracles, no supernatural acts of creation. And then second, uniformitarianism. Uniformitarianism is the belief that rates and conditions are kind of, have always been kind of what they are now, unless there's a unless there's a real good reason to think otherwise. 
and they would reject some of the really good reasons to think otherwise. So uh, like the worldwide flood, the worldwide flood caused canyons to erode much faster than they are today because you're dumping all this water very quickly off the continents. So secularists reject the worldwide flood because it violates their assumption of uniformitarianism. They believe that mountains were always raised at the kind of slow rates at which they're being pushed up today. There's a little bit of plate tectonics left over even today after the flood. And so mountains are being pushed up a little bit, but it's very slow today. That would have happened much more quickly during the flood year. So, but what I can do is I can temporarily say, okay, for the sake of hypothesis, let's assume naturalism. Let's assume this planet or moon or whatever was not supernaturally created. Let's assume that the processes today are like they've been in the past. And, it, it, and if we do the calculation, we find that the age is still much less than the 13.8 than the billion years for the universe, okay? So we're, st we're using the secular assumptions and showing that they lead to an inconsistency. For example, the, the internal heat from Jupiter, and I mentioned this in the previous presentation, Jupiter gives off twice as much energy as it gets from the sun every second of every day since creation. Gets one unit from the sun, gives away two. Gets one unit, spends away two. Kind of like our federal government, right? <laughs> yeah. And like our federal government, it can't do that forever. Because eventually it runs out of energy, right? It's losing energy all the time because it's giving away twice as much as it takes. And so it can't do that forever. 2.13 is the latest estimate. It gives off 2.13 times as much energy as it gets from the sun. And uh, it's, what, you know, it's a big planet, so it can do that for a while. It can do that for 6,000 years. And it's cooled off a little bit in 6,000 years. It's lost some energy. But if it's 4.5 billion years old, it ought to be an icicle by now. It shouldn't have any internal heat left. That's a problem in the secular view. You can think of it like a, um, you take a potato that's just been in the microwave and you bring it out. You can feel the heat coming off of it, right? That's radiative transfer. It's releasing energy, which you can feel. You come back two hours later, still warm? No. It's cold because it's radiated away all of its heat. Jupiter's been doing that since creation. Now it's a much bigger potato, so it can do that for 6,000 years. But if it was 4.5 billion years old, it's a huge problem. Problem's even worse for uh, Neptune. Neptune gives off uh, something like 2.6 times as much energy as it receives from the sun. That's a problem in the secular view. And I haven't seen a good explanation for that. Earth's magnetic field is decaying. We've been able to measure this, we'd expect it. Now, not the gravity field, you're not gonna float away. It's the magnetic field. The magnetic field is what causes your compass to point north, right? And so that magnetic field is diminishing. And we'd expect that. Magnetic fields are caused by electrical current in the core. And that in current encounters resistance, slows down, which, which causes the energy to drain. And it's, it's like anything else. The bigger the battery, the longer it lasts. Remember those old D-cell batteries? They're not used so often anymore, but they, man, they lasted forever because they're big. Um, and then you have the little triple A's that, you know, if, if it lasts through this presentation, you feel blessed, right? <laughs> so... Now, so the Earth's kind of a, you know, it's a medium-sized planet, but um, it's smaller than Jupiter, certainly. And we've been able to measure the magnetic field decay for the last 150 years or so. And it is decaying. And it's, it appears to be an exponential decay, as far as we can tell. And if you run back the half-life, that means the magnetic field would have been 20 times stronger at creation, which would have been nice, actually. Your, comp your compass would work really well at creation. But also that magnetic field acts as a barrier. It deflects cosmic rays, which are harmful. They can cause cancer and things like that. They damage your DNA. So uh, we'd, have, we'd have had increased protection at creation. That would have been nice. So it's decaying. It's never going to quite go to zero, but it's going to get weaker and weaker and weaker um, throughout even our lifetime. We've been able to measure that. And if you, the, the funny thing is, since it's an exponential decay, if you run it back um, 60,000 years, 60,000 years, not even a million. The, the magnetic field would have been so strong, it would be stronger than that of a neutron star, which would be enough to rip the atoms of your body apart. You don't want that. Okay, and before that would happen, it'd rip the iron out of your blood, so that'd be an issue. So that, I mean, that's 60,000 years. It's not even one million years, but the magnetic field can't be older than 60,000 years. It can't be much older than 6,000 years. That's a pretty tight constraint, if you think about it, because it's an exponential decay. Uh, Jupiter, again, has a whopping big magnetic field. And, which is why you can have aurora, aurora borealis, northern lights, which is what happens when uh, radiation from the sun disrupts the magnetic field and jiggles it. And you get these beautiful uh, northern lights, which you don't really see them too much in Texas, but it can, it can, they can get down this far. It's just rare. Uh, Uranus and Neptune both have strong planetary magnetic fields. 
And in fact, their current strength was predicted by a colleague of mine, Dr. Russ Humphreys, based on their biblical age of 6,000 years. I've always been impressed with that. I thought that's pretty neat. He, assuming 6,000 years, he was able to calculate what their current strength should be. And when Voyager, and he, he made that prediction in 84, and Voyager 2 flew past Uranus in 86, and then Neptune in 89, and Russ Humphreys' prediction was right. The seculars were way off. They thought those planets should be magnetically dead, being 4.5 billion years old, because they would be magnetically dead if they were 4.5 billion years old. Uh, lunar recession, the moon is actually moving away from the Earth due to tidal forces. You might note that the moon induces tides on the Earth. It pulls on the Earth's oceans. It pulls, it pulls this ocean away from the Earth. And you say, well, how do you get this bulge? Well, it's pulling the Earth away from that ocean. That's the way to think of that. So you get two tidal bulges. And the Earth rotates counterclockwise as seen from the north. And so those tidal bulges get ahead of the moon. And that causes them to pull forward on the moon. And when you pull forward on something that's in orbit, it moves out. It's a little counterintuitive, but when the astronauts want to go into a higher orbit, they thrust forward, and that moves them into a higher orbit, a more energetic um, position. Now, what that means is, if you run the movie backwards in the past, the moon would have been closer to the Earth, right? And we can measure that rate today. We left reflectors on the moon when the astronauts landed there. We can bounce lasers off of them and measure the distance within a fraction of an inch. It's kind of amazing. The moon is moving away at an inch and a half a year away from the Earth. And so you run it back to creation, the moon would have been 750 feet closer to the Earth at creation. 750 feet. Not a big difference considering it's 240,000 miles away. What's 750 feet among friends? But if you run it back millions of years, and we've done, and you have to do the calculation right, because if the, when the moon's closer to the Earth, the tidal bulges would be bigger which means the effect would be stronger. And so it, it really dives into the Earth at 1.45 billion years in a hypothetical past. Pretty amazing. And so, you, well, th that would be an upper limit on the possible age of the Earth-Moon system because you can't get less distance than zero distance, right? So that's an upper limit at 1.45 billion years. And you say, well, that's, that's a long time. Yes, but the Earth and Moon are supposed to be 4.5 billion years old in the secular view, right? And 1.4 is less than 4.5, for those of you that are common core educated, okay? So that's a problem. Comets. Comets are made up of ice and dirt, and they orbit around the sun in elliptical paths, coming close to the sun, and then whiplashing back out. And when they're far away from the sun, that ice remains frozen, but when they get close to the sun, as they do every orbit, the, that icy material is vaporized, blasted into space. That's what forms a comet's tail. That's material being blasted away by solar, uh, solar wind and radiation pressure. And sometimes you'll get two tails, an ion tail and then a dust tail. So they're very beautiful. But every time you see a comet, it's getting smaller. It's losing mass. That's what you're, you're seeing, comet debris being blasted away from it. And we know the source of the icy material is typically a few miles across. That's the typical size of the comet's nucleus, the source of the ice. And we can measure the rate at which it's being depleted because we can see it. We can at least estimate that. And we can estimate that a typical comet could last no more than about 100,000 years before it completely runs out of material. But in the secular view, the solar system is supposed to be 4.5 billion years old. So why do we still have comets? You see, that would be, that would be the, the problem there. And my secular colleagues have said, well, there's, there's a Kuiper belt that supplies the short period comets. There's an Oort cloud that, that's, that supplies the long period comets. Um, Kuiper belt's a little complicated, but it needs an Oort cloud to support it. And as far as we can tell, there is no Oort cloud. The idea of the Oort cloud is invented by a, named, a man named Jan Oort. And he said, well, maybe out beyond the farthest planets, there's this comet generator, basically. There's, there's thousands and thousands of potential comets orbiting in a circle where they never get close to the sun. And every now and then, one of them is dislodged and becomes a brand new comet, thrown into the inner solar system. And so as old comets disintegrate, new ones replace them. So that's, and that is the standard view today. Now, if you ask a secular astronomer if there's any evidence of an Oort cloud, if he's honest, he'll say no, because we don't. Of course, you can't disprove it because it's undetectable, right? So it's a nice rescuing device. But I would say comets are just evidence of the youth of the solar system. They're like the ice cream cones. So if, you, if, you, if you went into a sauna, it's nice and warm, and you see an ice cream cone just starting to melt, you wouldn't say, well, I'll bet that's been there for 20, 30 years. That'd be absurd, right? Yeah. And so when you see comets, you, you, you say, wow, it must be billions of years old. It can't be. They've got to be younger than that. They're the ice cream cones of the solar system. 
uh, Pluto. We talked about this in the previous presentation. Pluto was just um, wonderful for, it, for those of us who believe in biblical creation. When we saw these features and we saw evidence of geology on Pluto, mountain building, and these, these large convective patterns where there's, there's not a single impact crater in there, which means that's been convecting recently, which means Pluto has internal heat or at least had internal heat relatively recently and not it can't be billions of years old. It would be covered with craters, and we found relatively few craters. There's some. You can see some craters there, and we'd expect that over 6,000 years. There'd be some. But uh, the mountain building, that was totally unexpected from the secular viewpoint, and yet there they are. You can see mountains. Those are mountains on Pluto, and again, they're about as tall as the Rocky Mountains, but they're made of ice instead of rock because of that distance, ice is as hard as rock. Pluto's moon, Charon, its largest moon. Again, you got mountains. you got canyons. Uh, you got all kinds of interesting surface features that can't last billions of years. Spiral galaxies are an indication of the youth of the universe. Not all galaxies are spirals, but a lot of them are. And they have that lovely structure. And these spiral galaxies rotate differentially, which means the inner portions rotate faster than the outer portions in terms of the amount of time it takes for a star to make a loop. It takes less time here than it does out there. And so how long could that spiral structure last? I wanted to know, so I took, this is the Whirlpool Galaxy, and astronomers have measured the speeds of those stars from their Doppler shifts. This galaxy is actually, it looks face on, it's slightly tilted, and so we can measure the Doppler effect of those stars. And I ran a computer simulation out to see what this galaxy would look like if it were really, it's supposed to be 10 billion years old. So that number at the bottom represents, from today, the number of million years. And so if we run it out, 20 million years, 40 million years, by the time you get to 100 million years, look how twisted it is. And we don't see galaxies that look like that. So we don't see galaxies that look even 100 million years old, let alone, I ran it out, I only ran the simulation out to 1 billion years, because beyond, it's just ridiculous at that point. It looks like an old-fashioned phonograph record in terms of the way the grooves are. I mean, it's just... It's astonishing. So look at that. Do we see any galaxies anywhere that look like that? No. I, I've looked at thousands and thousands of galaxies. I've never seen one that looks like that. It's funny because sometimes secularists will say, well, if God made the universe 6,000 years ago, then why does it look so old? And I'm thinking, I don't know what universe you're looking at, but this one doesn't look old, right? That's a presupposition. Blue stars, blue stars can't last even millions of years because they're the most luminous stars. They, they, blue stars are the most massive. They have the most fuel, but they use it up at an alarming rate. They're the most luminous. They're kind of like an SUV. They got a big gas tank, but they get very poor gas mileage. And so they can't go very far in time before they run out of fuel. And there they are. These are the stars of Orion's belt. And I mean, they, they can't last billions of years. By the way, nobody disputes that. My secular colleagues, they don't dispute that. They would just say, well, they must have formed recently. But uh, we've never seen a star form. Gas doesn't want to come in and just kind of form a sphere. Now, once, a, once you have a star there, its own gravity will hold it together. But out in space, when you have these nebulae, the, force, the, in, the inward force of gravity is meager compared to the outward gas pressure because the force of gravity diminishes with the square of the distance. So it's tiny. So there's a lot of evidence that confirms the biblical age of the co cosmos. And again, what we've done is we've assumed for the sake of argument that these things were not supernaturally created and that they've always sort of been burning at the same rate as today. And you end up with ages that are much less than the secular age that's required for these structures. So it's an internal critique. Finally, the uniqueness of the earth. The earth really is unique. We'd expect that because God formed it to be inhabited. Isaiah 45:18. He is the God who formed the earth and made it. He established it and did not create it a waste place, but formed it to be inhabited. Earth's designed for life, perfectly designed for life. All the features that we have that you, we don't even think about them on a day-to-day -day basis, but they're there, covered with liquid water, which all life requires. An oxygen atmosphere, that's very rare. In fact, I don't think we've discovered any other world that has free oxygen in the atmosphere, and that's what we need to breathe and so on. Um, earth's neighbors, the moon, I love the moon. I'm jealous of the astronauts that got to walk on the surface, and apparently we're going to go back here in a couple of years, which is very exciting. Um, but yeah, it's not designed for life. Now, it's designed for life on Earth because it stirs Earth's oceans, and that, that helps us, but you're, it's not designed for life there. No atmosphere, no liquid water, nothing to eat. 
When the astronauts went to the moon, they had to bring a little bit of Earth with them to survive. A little air from the Earth, a little water from the Earth, a little food from the Earth, and so on. The surface temperature between day and night, hundreds of degrees. So there's, they, they, they were at a location that was shortly after sunrise, and so it wasn't that hot yet. It's, kind of, you know, it's the same way with Earth's neighbors as well. Uh, Mercury and Venus, way too hot. Mars, way too cold. It's kind of like Goldilocks and the Three Bears. The Earth's just right, just right for life. And we'd expect that because it was formed to be inhabited, which, brings, which raises the question about extraterrestrial life. And the Bible doesn't address extraterrestrial life unless you count things like angels. There is a spiritual realm, of course. But in terms of biological life on other planets, the Bible doesn't address that. Uh, it doesn't say there's not. But at the same time, um, Earth is uniquely designed for life. And that makes me think that Earth is the only place with life. And... That makes a lot of sense because if you, if you think about it, if you have intelligent life out in space, you've got some theological issues you're going to have to think through, right? Because if you've if you got Vulcans and Klingons out there, they can't be saved, right? Because they're not related to Jesus. Remember, it's because we're related to Jesus that his blood can atone for us on the cross. He's our blood relative. He's our kinsman redeemer. But Lieutenant Commander Worf, he's out of luck because uh, he's, not, he's not related to Jesus, you see. And so he can't be saved. And you say, well, maybe Jesus uh, went to the Klingon homeworld and died for them. No, because the Bible says he died once for all. He was raised incorruptible, which means he'll never die again. So the Klingons are out of Well, maybe they never sinned. Well, then they're suffering the, the result of the curse without, because all creation groans under the bondage of corruption. So, so I think it's, you've got some theological issues you'd have to think through if you've got civilizations out there. So I don't expect to find that. Um, I guess if you found moss out there or something like that, that wouldn't be a big theological issue. Although I don't even expect to find that because the other kinds of life we find seem to be designed to support us, basically. Even microbes, which help plants take in minerals and things like that. And then the animals eat the plants or we eat the plants or we eat the animals that eat the plants and it, su it supports us. So, but there's a big pull to find extraterrestrial life, partly I think to vindicate evolution the idea is if life evolved here, probably evolved elsewhere, big universe. Not cogent reasoning, really, but that's the thinking. And then a lot of times, if you ask a secularist, why is it that you want to find ETs out there so bad? And a lot of times the answer is, it's, what's the feeling of cosmic loneliness? I mean, it'd be nice not to be alone in the universe. Uh, we, we, sort of, we sort of want this, there to be a superior life form out there that could give us the answers, the meaning of life. And maybe they've developed technology that, that could cure our diseases. Maybe they've even figured out how to beat death entirely. And if you think about it, that's God. <laughs> See, we have a built-in need for God. And when you reject that God, that need will come out in other ways. And so I think a lot of the hype for extraterrestrials is because you've rejected the biblical God and you want to fill that God hole. And that's what they try to use to do it. So that... That's my speculation. But I have, I have talked with a number of secularists, that, and they give answers like that. So no, the Earth is very special. It really is. And you know, it's, uh, in, in one sense, it's the pale blue dot, as Carl Sagan put it. It's just so small compared to the other things we see in space. But that really just shows us how big God is. Because of all those worlds that we've looked at today, hundreds of billions of stars, hundreds of billions of galaxies, this is the one where God walked. This is the one where God became a man and, and paid for our sins on the cross and promised to save us and resurrect us if we would just trust in him, repent of our sins and trust in him, believe the gospel. Pretty neat. One of the astronauts who walked on the moon, Jim Irwin, uh, at the time, he was not a Christian when he walked on the moon, but later he became a Christian and a, very, and a biblical creationist. He was a solid guy. And there's a quote by him, something to the effect of, the amazing thing is not that man walked on the moon, but that God walked on the earth. I think that's amazing. I think that's amazing. Yeah. So I hope that's been a blessing to you. So the universe does declare God's glory. It really does. And I hope that's been a blessing to you. So again, check out the resources. I won't go through them all except to point out that this talk, a lot of what I mentioned here is covered in taking back astronomy. And don't forget about the packs as well, because all these you can get on the website, but the packs you can only get, the packs you can only get here today. And I would like you to go ahead and, and do your, finish up your uh, book shopping. Uh, before the Q&A. If you want to come back, we'll have a Q&A in about 15 minutes. And uh, a lot of people, that's kind of fun because I never know what I'm going to get with those. That's always interesting. So, and remember to sign up for our monthly newsletter. How many of you already signed up for the newsletter? Okay, that's less than half. The rest of you need to repent of that sin and sign up for the newsletter. Check us out on the web, Biblical Science Institute. Thank you very much.